My name is Arshad Ahmad. I'm the AVP Teaching and Learning and also the director of the McPherson Institute. We have the pleasure of co-hosting this event with the Office of International Affairs, uh, represented here today by uh, uh, Ni Jadon. He's in the back, uh, senior project manager, and of course, uh, Peter Masher, who's in the front, AVP International Affairs. And shortly, you will hear Peter introduce our, our speakers, uh, Stephen Davis, executive director, um, and Carl Strobe. Uh, you will hear from them speak about the work of academics without borders. I wanted to preface uh, the talks today by talking just a little bit about the kind of immense educational gaps that exist today, perhaps in, in, in its broadest sense. Um, but before I, before I even do that, there, there is an extraordinary gap that um, I, I guess many have been sort of pointing to if you, if you look at uh, how can we ignore some of the political events that have been unfolding, you can go back to Brexit or you can go back just a couple of weeks ago. Um, and it seems like uh, the kind of division that these events have caused around the world um, at least reveal one of those gaps known as the wealth gap. And, and you're struck by this particular gap because it's so measurable. In fact, uh, uh, I thought it was best explained by Oxfam which is a confederation of charitable organizations uh, and that reveals and they have revealed that there are 62 individuals who have more wealth than the poorest half of the world's population so that's about 3.75 billion people um, anyway <clears throat> that's distressing um, and if you're struck by the wealth gap um, I think a lot of us in the room think there is another education gap that's even wider. And that education gap can be found just about in every country developed or otherwise, and especially, of course, between the northern and southern hemispheres. So if you believe, as many do, that uh, education is a democratic right, and, and it's not necessarily a, the kind of privilege we're born into, one of the challenges is to identify where the education gap exists. And perhaps one solution is to join hands with those who are effectively reducing those gaps. So I want to just briefly touch upon three types of education gaps. The first one is probably the most familiar to all of us in this room, and that's the gap within academia. Uh, so these are caused by, of course, differences between poor teachers and good teachers. Uh, the ones between poorly designed programs and well-designed programs. Um, and of course, courses, uh, poor courses, good courses, and the ones that students can get into um, or the ones that you take by default. So closing this particular kind of an academic gap that we deal with, of course, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis in our McPherson Institute and of, co of course in other teaching and learning centers around the country, around the world. So um, we work with curriculum, we work with uh, um, uh, evidence-based practices, and then, of course, mostly we try and strengthen relationships with people so that learning can flourish. So, of course, this is important. <laughs> but I'd like you to think about another kind of gap. The second gap is between someone who happens to, say, grow up in Kathmandu in Nepal and someone who grows up in, say, Toronto in Canada. Um, the gap is visible at so many levels that it's kind of hard to think of these gaps holistically. Um, and even if we address one of these gaps through what we might think is a small intervention, uh, let's say, for example, we go and train a trainer, uh, this can have some incredibly large multiplier effects and the impact on entire communities. So you will hear about these kinds of examples in, in the talk today. Finally, let me just talk about the third more insidious education gap that kind of interacts with other gaps, and that could be with health and life expectancy or with economic uh, opportunities and per capita income. And of course, with hope that fuels human development. And so when you hear about academics without borders, uh, these 
types of intersections, in fact, influence the work that they, where they will go for the work that they do. Uh, they look at the Human Development Index that is used to rank countries into tiers of development. And uh, for those of you who are familiar with this index, countries like uh, the Nordic countries, Switzerland, uh, US, Canada, etc., are in the top tier, whereas uh, countries like uh, um, Chile, Ethiopia, um, not Chile, Ethiopia, uh, Ghana, Li Liberia, uh, Namibia, Nepal, Rwanda are in the bottom tier. And it is in these bottom tier countries where uh, systems are stifling the abilities of teachers and impede the progress of learners. And it is in these very countries that Academics Without Borders choose to intervene. So let me end by saying that there is something really quintessentially Canadian about the work of Academics Without Borders and, and the types of uh, projects they engage in. Uh, you may know or not that uh, AWB or Academics Without Borders is the largest NGO in the world working to close these education gaps and uh, for many of us, we think this is one of Canada's best kept secrets. So thank you very much for joining us uh, this afternoon uh, and uh, with uh, international affairs to learn about academics without borders and hopefully how you might get involved to close the education gaps in whatever ways that you can. Thank you very much and Peter, please introduce our speakers. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Peter Mascher. I'm the Associate Vice President for International Affairs. And it is uh, a great pleasure to welcome you all to this, uh, what, is, what I'm sure is going to be uh, a, very interesting, uh, a very interesting afternoon. Um, the timing of, uh, of the visit by uh, Academics Without Borders couldn't have been much better. Uh, many, some of you will, will know that we are in the process of uh, redeveloping our international strategy and uh, one of the key elements of that redevelopment is to focus on global engagement and uh, so uh, to connect with an organization with a long track record such as Academics Without Borders is uh, just one of many, many steps that is, uh, that is required to, uh, to expand McMaster's footprint uh, internationally and to identify areas where global engagement uh, is meaningful and, uh, and, and can take place. Um, so uh, let me just give you a, a very brief uh, background uh, to our efforts of engaging globally. Uh, several years ago, our uh, president, Patrick Dean, uh, issued um, a document called Forward with Integrity, which outlined uh, many uh, aspects of, uh, of development within, uh, within academia and within McMaster specifically. Uh, and uh, one of the, um, and, and of course it contained several key pillars uh, in which we needed to develop. Uh, internationalization, as we called it at the time, was, uh, was one of them. And uh, let me just quote a couple of statements because uh, they are quite relevant to, uh, to the discussion that we are going to have later today. Um, so in this document, Forward with Integrity, Global Engagement, the emphasis on global engagement was articulated as the transformation of the university uh, on its own ground, whereby our academic orientation and breadth of knowledge embraces the globe, our approach to any problem is informed by global awareness. Uh, so it is really meant to become a pervasive uh, attitude uh, towards global engagement and understanding of global matter uh, rather, than, rather than just a top-down imposition of, uh, of projects that we, should, uh, that we should engage in because it's opportune or it's, uh, it's um, uh, from a financial perspective, uh, a, 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 an interesting thing to do. Um, but there's also another important aspect, and that aspect is that one needs to recognize that as an expression of global citizenship, which is really what we want to create among our, our students and staff and faculty, global engagement is not just awareness. 
but rather it requires an active orientation to the challenges of the world. And I think that's where the connection to Academic Without Borders becomes a, a, fairly, obvious, uh, a fairly obvious one. And then as Arshad just pointed out, of course many of these challenges uh, can be found in the developing world. Uh, and so again, the connection to AWB is, is, is fairly obvious. Um, might, for those of you who are interested, we just published uh, uh, last June, we published um, a strategy document which, uh, which we call the McMaster Model for Global Engagement. Um, I, would be, I would be very happy to, uh, to send you uh, electronic copies of this document. Uh, it outlines, uh, it is, is intended to be a, a philosophical document, if you want, at this stage, outlining um, <coughs> ethical and uh, conceptual principles rather than a roadmap yet. And we are currently in the process of engaging with stakeholders at the faculties, the students, the staff, to, to see what, uh, what the next steps should be in, uh, in realizing these visions that are expressed in this, um, in this strategy document. Uh, of course, overall, uh, McMaster faculty, staff, students have been engaged uh, internationally in many, many, in many different ways, in research projects, in student exchanges, uh, in, learning, um, in, in, in learning enterprises, and there are many uh, there are many areas of expertise at McMaster that are in demand internationally. And, uh, you know, when uh, just yesterday I had a very, good, uh, a very good discussion with the Faculty Council and the Faculty of Social Sciences, and we, uh, we talked about the, the risk sometimes that um, North American and European universities uh, see in engaging with the developing world because there is this perceived attitude of, you know, we know all the answers and we just deliver solutions to, to the developing world, which uh, clearly, uh, clearly is, not, uh, is not the case because solutions developed in, let's say, North America uh, do not always work in the developing world if one doesn't take into account the local environment and the, the local political situation and social structure and, and so on. But that said, um, McMaster University is one of the world's best recognized research universities. We are consistently ranked in the top 100 research universities in the world. And so we do have something to offer. And there is demand for expertise in many different areas. Uh, one of them is the probably the best known uh, expertise that we have here on campus is problem-based learning uh, and evidence-based medicine and there is significant demand worldwide for that expertise, be it through training, be it through uh, education of trainers, as, as Arshad mentioned. And so we need to balance carefully, um, we need to balance carefully the uh, the, the risk on the one hand not to be perceived as, as uh, just, just delivering packaged solutions and on the other hand make available the knowledge and the expertise that we do have and support what we broadly call capacity building in, uh, on, an, on an international scale. So this just as, as a few words of background um, that sets the stage I hope for, for, for the presentations this afternoon. So um, I'm delighted to welcome uh, Academics Without Borders. Um, uh, as you will hear and as you've seen from this slide deck, uh, Academics Without Borders is working in many, many different countries. Uh, it was interesting for me to see when I, mean, I, I browsed through one of, the, one of the brochures that there are projects in Liberia. And uh, you, may have, uh, you may have heard just a few days ago our Prime Minister uh, was in Liberia and signed uh, major collaboration agreements, especially with the focus on empowering uh, women and educating women. And so the connection is um, is, is nearly perfect. So those those are the kinds of examples of of where we try to assist, where we try to contribute, and where we try to um, to to help. We are very fortunate that we will hear today from uh, Dr. Stephen Davis. Um, who is the founder and executive director of uh, Academics Without Borders. He is a professor emeritus of philosophy 
at both Simon Fraser and Carleton Universities and an adjunct of philosophy at McGill and the Université Montréal. Uh, we are also looking forward to the presentation of Dr. Carl Stobbe, I hope that's correctly pronounced, from, from McMaster, who has practiced and taught rural family medicine uh, for over 20 years. Uh, he also led the expansion planning team for the Michael de Groot School of Medicine at McMaster, where he developed medical campuses in the Waterloo and Niagara regions. And since 2008, he has served as the first regional assistant dean of the Niagara campus. Internationally, Carl is involved in medical education projects. Uh, in Nepal, you mentioned uh, Nepal and the Philippines. We had a brief conversation about that and in Peru. So I would like to invite you to uh, welcome very warmly our guests and we look forward to your presentations. Thank you very much. Um, hi, everybody, and I'd like to thank you for coming. And before I begin, I'd like to thank some people who are here in the audience today. I'd like to uh, begin with Arshad Ahmad, who, as you know, is a member of the AWB board. He is a fabulous member of the board. He ha comes up with one new idea that's fabulous after another. Uh, I appreciate his encouragement and his enormous energy. Uh, we are very lucky to have him on our board. The McMaster is very lucky to have him here. He was in Montreal, and I wish he were still there. Uh, the second person I'd like to uh, thank is Ani Jadon, who I met at a meeting recently and had a long conversation with him and Narshad uh, just before this. And uh, what I found so wonderful is that the three of us share the same values about university life, that they are value institutions. And I see that your uh, VP International shares those attitudes as well about the nature of education, the higher education. The next person I'd like to thank is Muriel McKay in the back. Uh, she arranged uh, my visit here and she was so considerate. She asked me even whether I was gluten intolerant. Uh, you know, and, and I, I really appreciate the care with, and thoughtfulness by, by, uh, in, the, in the way that she did this. I, there's a special place in heaven for you. And the next person is Sylvia, the stylish uh, Sylvia uh, Avery. Uh, who is somebody I've known for a little while here, uh, who is the contact person I can find where, where's Arshad, I would say. And she is uh, so gracious in the replies that she gives to me, and I'd like to thank her very much in being that kind of contact person. So I'm going to talk to you today about uh, this organization, and <clears throat> I'm going to tell you about the organization, and then I'm going to tell you about one of the projects that we're involved in. So this should go, no, don't seem to be working. Did I turn it off? Yes, I turned it off. Okay, so this is about us. Firstly, what you have to do is to look at some of these things, but not all of them. Uh, we began in uh, 2007. We are a bilingual organization based in Montreal. We do projects in Anglophone and Francophone countries. Uh, we have done, since 2009, when we sent out our first volunteer, over 75 projects with 100 volunteers, roughly. And we have, I think, about 30 now in the books. We have Canadian charitable status and US charitable status. And we have representatives in 65 uh, universities in Canada. And there's something else that I'm going to tell you about at the end, uh, later on in the talk. Now, what do we do? What is the mission, the purpose of our organization? It's to help universities in the countries that fall in the lowest category of countries in the United Nations Development Program Development Index. These are the countries that most need help. And there are about 80 or so countries in that with some 500 universities. Now, why do we do this? Why do you want to improve universities? Why are universities important? I think they're important. I hope people in this audience think they're important. Well, it, it's because the universities are the place where people get educated. Uh, they are the ones who train our doctors, train our professors, train uh, the engineers, et cetera, et cetera, so that countries can develop. Think for a moment what Canada would be like 
if tomorrow somebody says, all your universities are closed, it's finished, it's over with, gone, what would happen? What would be the result of that? Well, maybe in the next months or years you wouldn't notice much, but eventually you would notice that you don't have a doctor to go to. You don't have an engineer to build that building, et cetera, et cetera. And the important point is it's taken us a very long time to build up the quality educational system that we have. Universities play a key role, a key role in our own development, and they play a key role in the development of the world that is developing. Now, how do we do that? How does AWB assist? Well, what we think of ourselves is an expert transfer organization. So the universities come to us and say, look, we need help in this area, this area, or this area, and we go out then and find the experts that can help them with what they need. And they have to identify the need and identify the activities in which they wish us to engage. It has to come from them. They have to take the leader, leadership in what goes on here. And I'll talk about this some more. So you can see one of our volunteers in Liberia there. Now, I think this is important, and let me see if I can get this thing to work. Well, you see the, that little thing in red there? That's one of our volunteers. And what is that volunteer doing? That volunteer is training others there and training the trainers. So our volunteers work not just in teaching or research, but also in back office operations, anything universities are engaged in. But so let's take this fellow here to be teaching the professors. Okay, so here we got the professors. And then next we've got the students that these professors teach. And then those students go out to be the doctors, the engineers, and so forth in the, the world. And you can see the kind of impact it has on the population at large. And it begins with that one person there. And I think that is extremely important to keep in mind. Now, where do we work? Well, <clears throat> as I say, we restrict ourselves to only about 80 countries in the world of 187. And these are the countries that we would call the least developed. Uh, countries like Canada don't really need help, but countries like Ghana, Ethiopia, Rwanda really knew, they need our assistance. And we think that they need our assistance because they come to us and ask for help, and that's important. Now, as I say, the projects come from and are owned by the developing world institutions. That's key to what we do and how we operate. In addition, we ask the institutions to contribute to the expenses of our projects. So what are the expenses of our projects? Well, we take volunteers, they're not paid. We take people, Carl Stobe has been one of our volunteers. And what we do is uh, to cover uh, all or part of their expenses. And one of the expenses, of course, is housing them. They go off to uh, Nepal or Ghana or wherever. And if the university on the other end, our partner can provide housing, that's a way of contributing in kind. Some of them are able to provide a stipend for local cost, and some of them even provide airfare, and AWB picks up the, the rest of the uh, uh, costs. <clears throat> Here's something that's extremely important. Uh, we do not bring academics or students from the developing world to do their studies in the developed world. And the reason for that, it's so important, is the brain drain. Now, I will never criticize a young person who leaves his or her home country, studies abroad, and then stays abroad. That's an individual decision. But at the same time, we have to realize that this has an adverse effect on the developing country to lose some of their best uh, young people to uh, other countries outside of their own country. Now, we try to keep the costs of our projects and our operations very low. And the costs run from 1,500 to 9,000. The average cost of a placement is only $4,000. That's not a heck of a lot of money, folks. That's not a great deal of money. When I tell that to other organizations, they say, we can't believe you. And I say, it's true we're able to keep our costs very low. We keep our operational costs very low because we have a virtual office. 
people say, well, where's your office? And I say, right here, just where I happen to be. You know, and so I'm in touch with the people who work for us by internet and telephone. And a lot of us don't get paid. I don't get paid for what I do, and I have other people who don't get paid for what they do. And all the people who work and get paid on an hourly basis, they're consultants, that's what we call them, contribute part of their hours to us pro bono. So the volunteers, Carl, for example, a wonderful volunteer for us, does not get paid. We cover expenses. And here's something else that we don't do. We don't tra transfer funds or equipment to the developing world. Other people do that kind of thing. And institutions in the developing world can get equipment from other sources. As I said before, what we do is transfer expertise. That's what they're asking for. That's what they say that they need. And here again is the key. The institutions in the developing world are the, ins the instruments of change. You know, that's got to be at the center of this. They know better than we do what they need and how to carry these things out. We just help them along the way. That's what we're there for, to help them along the way. And uh, we, we find that that's what what's makes what we do sustainable because we take their advice about how to go forward with this. We're working in partnership with them, remember that. And they're the lead partner in what we do, the lead partner. <clears throat> so with this, as I say, to help them along the way. We work in any area in which universities are active. Now I talked to somebody here from an alumni office. There we go, and she's probably gonna be a volunteer for us, okay? <laughs> No, she's smiling now. She's smiling now <laughs> because we, would, we have a possible project in Liberia. They want to build an alumni office. And it's important to have an alumni office. It's important to have a registrar's office. It's important to have a budget office in a university. So we work in those areas as well. Uh, we've, we've done a whole range of different sorts of things. We also work, of course, in teaching. And we also work in uh, doing research capacity building. Now take a look at this. I, I want some of you to take a look at this, okay? I took those pictures. This is at the University of Liberia. That's their registrar's office. Can you imagine? That university has no idea what's going on at the level of its courses or what students are in that institution. So obviously what they need is to upgrade their registrar's office. Now, <clears throat> you know, why do you have an organization like this? Uh, it, it's because higher education has been mostly neglected in the developing world. And it's been neglected by the aid community. The old CETA, which was folded into Global Affairs Canada, was not really supportive of higher education. I can tell you a story about that. Uh, they put their funds into primary education and basic health. And I remember somebody telling me this early on. And I said, gee, how can you have good primary education without having well-trained teachers? And they come from universities. How can you have good basic health without having well-trained health workers? And they come from universities. And the administrators, to boot, who have to run these sorts of things, they're educated at universities. And if you don't have that element, you're not going to have good teachers. You're not going to have good schools, and you're not going to have good health care. So that's the point I've just made, that have good basic education, good health. It has to have well-educated people in order to staff them and run them. OK, I want to take a, an example of a, a country in which we're working. And first, I want you to look at the uh, points about the, the, uh, where this country stands. Ethi Ethiopia, big country. It has about 100 million people now, roughly. It's hard to know because it's very hard to do a census. And, and just take a look at, you know, uh, this is the figures from the development index that I talked about. So Canada is, I think, at ninth or eighth or something like that. Norway is at one. So Ethiopia is the 173rd. And they count a lot of things in this index. Uh, uh, Arshad and I were talking about this. Uh, a short time ago. There are lots and lots of things. Uh, but if you look at all the elements in this, Ethiopia is a very, very, very poor country. 
and uh, I just want to point this out here on this map. Uh, the project that we're going to be doing, that I'm going to be talking to you about, is up here in this part of the country, uh, where the capital is right here. Take a look at this statistic about maternal and infant mortality, the comparison between Ethiopia and Canada. I mean, this is just unbelievable. Just look at the maternal mortality rate. That's just shocking. It, it, it just absolutely shocking to think about that. The, the number of women who die in childbirth, the number of infants who die uh, at birth, <clears throat> and compare it again with, uh, with Canada's. Now, <clears throat> I say that uh, Ethiopia has about 100 million people, and this is what I found out recently. And I'm going to say this slowly. They have, for all those people, 13 cardiologists. 13. That's it. That's all. And most of them are around the capital. Well, you know, you, you might say, you just need cardiologists for old people like you, Stephen. That's, you know, th that's what you need cardiologists for. And I'm going to try to show that that's not the case. So let's take a look at uh, cardiovascular disease. And Carl knows all about this. And I hope I get my facts right here. Uh, it is one, pro it's the biggest killer in the world. Biggest. Right? Kills more people. And a very high percentage of those deaths occur in lower income countries. And it's not just old people that suffer from cardiovascular disease. Not just old people. So if it was old people, we wouldn't care so much. I mean, you know, Stephen, you know, you're an old guy, so what? <laughs> it's young people, it's children who get rheumatic fever. And they develop heart diseases and heart conditions, and they die at a very early age. And a lot of people in these countries die in their most productive periods, and it's a great loss for these countries. Well, I was talking about, <coughs> about the disease and the impact it has on uh, the lowest income countries. Uh, <clears throat> in those lowest income countries, the people who are most affected are the poorest, peoples in the poorest people in those countries. So it's not the people high up who are eating you know, fatty foods, but the poorest people suffer from these kinds of, of, of uh, this, this disease. And here's the, the, the interesting thing. By 2030, cardiovascular disease will become the leading cause of death, the leading cause of death in low-income countries in Africa. <clears throat> now here's the project that we're engaged in. The Kelly University contacted us and said, you know, what we need is upgrading, uh, firstly, of our teaching of cardiology, and then we would like to have a residency program in cardiology. In our area, there are five or six million people or more, and there are no cardiologists, not one, they can do any kind of intervention in cardiology, and we need some help. So uh, Dr. Cabetti uh, contacted us, and what we did first was to send over these two volunteers from the University of Alberta. They're both professors of cardiology to do a needs assessment. You know, one of the things you have to do before you can intervene is to find out what they need and what they're capable of absorbing. And, th and that's very important, the ability to absorb. You know, there's what we call aid overload. <laughs> you know, <coughs> there are too many aid workers in a country, and the country doesn't know what the hell to do with them. So we have to see whether we have to see whether this university was uh, willing and able uh, to absorb uh, the kinds of things uh, that uh, we were going to do. Now, here's I think the interesting thing, and I talked about this briefly, but I wanted to make this a graphic here. Take a look at the contribution of the Kelly University. So they are able to provide housing, they provide meals in their cafeteria, uh, which they make available to uh, their, their staff, and, uh, and they made it available to our volunteers, and they do in-country transportation. So our volunteers fly in to Addis, the capital, and then from there up to McKellar, you have to take another airplane, and MU pays for that. And we pay for the rest, that is the airfare from in this case, it was Canada, but our volunteers can come from anywhere. Uh, we pay for vaccinations, visa, medication. And so for two volunteers now, two, two volunteers on this needs assessment, it cost 
$5,624, or in U.S. dollars, that amount of money. That's not a great deal of money, folks. <clears throat> so what are the next steps? Uh, the next step, after the needs assessment, was to send teams of people, not just a cardiologist. But you have to do this in teams, and this is not something that I decided. It's something that our partner in the developing world worked out with those people who did the needs assessment. So we were going to, we sent a cardiologist, technician, and a, perhaps a nurse who specializes in cardiovascular disease. And we were going to do this over a period of time uh, because we, we can't send somebody there for six months. I mean, you know, people in the health field in Canada can't take six months off and then just go off to Ethiopia. So we have to do this spread out over a period of time. And so we want the, I'm sorry, I pressed on the wrong button. We want the outcome to be improved teaching of cardiology to the MU medical students. That's the first level of the outcome. And then we hope that that improvement will result in improved health care in, for cardiovascular disease. So here's the second step. Uh, we followed it up by sending two people. This is the first uh, <clears throat> group that we sent. We sent out a cardiologist and a, a technician to do that. Now, the future, what are we going to do? We're just starting this project, mind you. We have to do a plan for the residency program. We have to find partners to work with, and maybe McMaster will be one of our partners, I hope. Uh, we have to raise funds for the program. Even though we don't have great expenses, we have some expenses. And I hope if you look in your folders, you have a form to fill out there to donate to us. They are making my pitch, and I hope that you will find uh, your interest in, in donating to us for this. And here's the other thing that's important. We're not an in and out organization. And, and Carl, I think, is a witness to this, what we're doing in Nepal. We're in it for the long haul. Uh, it's going to take us, I think, something like 10 years to build a residency program. It's a very, very long process. But we have the intention of being in it for the long haul. OK, so let me just sum up the approach here. And I think that's something that's important that we have to see here. And I'll finish very soon. Uh, so <clears throat> they have to originate from the developing world. They have to have st stakeholders who are involved in them. <clears throat> they determine the activities of the project. They contribute financially or in kind. They make the final decisions even about the volunteers if we have more than one capable volunteer. And they sustain the activities after our volunteer leaves. They are the agents of change. So here's what we do. We assist them in drafting the proposals if they need that kind of help. We determine whether we can do the project, you know, whether we have, if it's a project that's going to take five million dollars over two years, of course we're not going to be able to do it. Uh, we recruit the volunteers, we prepare them for their postings, we make the travel arrangements, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we do all the kinds of things that are necessary in order to get that, our projects off the ground. Now, next thing I want to tell you about is how McMaster is already involved in what we do. We've just started a network, and this is one of the things that add on to who we are. AWB just started a network of universities. We just started this in September, just a few months ago. And 15 universities have signed up for already, uh, <clears throat> including McMaster. And the universities pay a fee to us. It's a very modest fee. I don't know what McMaster's fee is, but it's just a few thousand dollars. And in turn, they get a variety of benefits. Uh, they get benefits of being able to participate in uh, a number of different ways in our activities. So. One of the ways that they're able to participate is that maybe some of you in this audience have projects that fall under AWB's mission, but you have no support for it. No support from McMaster, no support from an outside source. Uh, we have twice a year at least, that is AWB, a call for proposals from our network institutions, and you can then submit that through me uh, or directly to us that you would like to have support for the, what you're doing. 
We then contact the institution with which you're working and find out whether they really need this and want it. And if they do, and you're an appropriate volunteer, uh, we then take you on as a volunteer and the project as an AWB project. Another possibility is that we get projects that come to us from these institutions, uh, not from an academic at a network institution, and the network partners, the academics there, have the first priority in being volunteers. So I would send out to me the job description. You would circulate that amongst the people at McMaster. And if there were good volunteers from McMaster or somebody from another networking institution, we then would choose them without going more broadly to our 65 representatives throughout Canadian universities. So that's two of the advantages. Now, there are other advantages uh, that <clears throat> we can uh, talk about. Uh, the last one I want to point out to you is uh, a campus chapter for students. We are helping institutions in the network start campus chapters for students so that students can participate in various ways in our activities. And one, here's the activities that they can involve in. Uh, the possibility of interning for us where they stay at home and intern with us virtually. Uh, they can uh, make contact with students at the countries in which we work, the universities in which they work, and they can learn about a developing world through uh, finding out what we do and how we do it. And the, another one is they, the possibility that students can go overseas uh, as assistants to our volunteers. If the volunteer needs an assistant and our institution in the developing world was willing to take on a, a student. And then there are lots of other activities that uh, students can engage in where they can learn through engaging in those activities. Now here's the contact information. That's how you can get in touch with me if you'd like more information about our organization. And I'm sure that Arshad or Ni nee can provide you with that. So I think that's all that I have to say and I want to thank you for li listening to me. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, and uh, what I'm going to talk to you about is one Academics Without Borders project, um, the one that I, that I lead. Um, and it's, in, uh, it, it's supported by Academics Without Borders. And uh, Stephen has explained the, the kind of support that they provide for projects. Um, but it's also supported by the Society of Rural Physicians of Canada, uh, not with any funding uh, or infrastructure support, but that's where the workers typically come from. So um, I want to recognize both of those. And the organization that we're working with there is the Patent Academy of Health Sciences. This is their statement of purpose. I'll just give you some time to read it. Um, it's a bit unusual in my experience for an institution of higher learning. The Patent Academy of Health Sciences started around 2006-2008. They've just graduated their first cohort of, uh, of doctors. And uh, they're the, the only medical school in Nepal whose stated purpose is to produce doctors for rural Nepal. So Nepal is short of doctors overall. Um, and those doctors that are there are largely in the one or two or three major cities. Um, and I'm, this is going to be all about doctors, and I'm not under any kind of aspersions that doctors are, uh, are the root of all health. But um, this is a medical school. There have been some frustrations, there have been several attempts in Nepal to create uh, doctors for rural Nepal. Um, and typically in order to do that, you have to take people that come from rural Nepal who typically can't afford to go to medical school. Um, and the profit motive always ends up taking over, so the university ends up ch charging higher and higher fees so that typically uh, rich people from India can get to medical school and then practice in India and make a lot of money. Um, uh, that's a very uh, oversimplification, but uh, um, but it ends up that the net result is there are very few doctors in rural Nepal. Um, so this, this organization was created apart from a university. The principals in this, in PAWS, tried creating a medical school for rural, rural Nepal under the auspices of one of the universities and the profit motive hijacked it before the students were in their third year. Okay. So this is the Patent Academy of Health Sciences. It's a standalone um, organization, uh, high, organization of higher learning, and when they started, the only thing that they taught was medical school. They're now in the midst of developing a school of nursing and a school of public health, which um, 
might be launched next year. Um, and uh, Academics Without Borders is also very supportive of the uh, School of Public Health. So I just thought this was an interesting mission statement. That's a word I haven't seen really in any, uh, in any sort of statement of purpose for any institute of higher learning. Um, and it reflects a little bit about the, the mindset of the, uh, the principals, but also of the, uh, of the people in Nepal. This is Patton Hospital. This is a, a hospital in uh, um, the, the city of Patton. Um, Patton is one of the three uh, cities that comprise the Ka greater Kathmandu. Uh, so Kathmandu, Patton, and one other, one other city. And so it's, uh, it, it has for years been, been in existence there. It's a large sort of uh, urban um, teaching hospital. And, um, and that's where it's based. This is Rajesh Gangal, the, the first dean. He's, now, uh, he's no longer the dean anymore. Uh, he was the founding dean for the Patton Academy of Health Sciences. Dr. Gangal is a general surgeon, and he continued to be a general surgeon during his tenure as dean. Um, and uh, Dr. Gangal is just very interested in improving the health of his people. So he's standing in front of the hospice, Hospice Nepal, the first hospice in Nepal. Dr. Gangal decided that there was no system for palliative care in Nepal, so he created one, and he basically, with, with donors from within the country, built this hospice, and he rounds there every morning on his way to the hospital where he's the dean. And when he's out of country or something like that, he can find one person to replace him, but generally he is, the, he is Nepal's palliative care system, as it exists right now. And in order to provide palliative care to rural communities, he actually has uh, trained some health volunteers in rural communities who go and visit people in their homes um, and can connect with him by cell phone. In addition to that, he's also um, created the first trained ambulance service. Um, so typically ambulances are, are, are trucks with a roof and volunteers kind of drag injured people into them and then, and then rush them to the hospital through traffic that crawls along. Um, what he did was he created trained paramedics and uh, uh, again a first for that country. Um, it's currently only in Kathmandu but you have to start somewhere. Um, and then the third contribution he made is Dean, he's created a disaster plan for Patton Hospital in the event of any sort of natural or other kind of disaster and he included the med medical students in the disaster plan because they would be um, additional hands that, that might help in any disaster. Um, in order to create doctors for rural Nepal, um, at medical students have, uh, need to understand the landscape and where they will be going. So um, the, uh, uh, the Patent Academy of Health Sciences, as it was developed, actually was supported by Academics Without Borders as well. And some basic scientists were placed there to help with curriculum design and curriculum development. Um, I got involved before in, in some of those early days. And I saw that their plan for, for clinical training um, was, a, was fairly traditional, straightforward, and based in the city. Um, and so through many, many conversations, they ended up deciding that six months, uh, for six months, every student needs to learn in a rural hospital in Nepal. Because, of course, that's the landscape that they're training for. Um, and so we helped them kind of select appropriate rural hospitals. And they ended up having, they now have four. And every student spends six months of their final year in a rural hospital, about two-thirds of the time is actually in the hospital and one-third of the time is in a public health unit because if you want to make a difference in a low-income country you have to understand public health and population health. So there, these are the hospitals that the, the four hospitals that they're being trained at. One is Gorka Hospital um, that you may have heard that word that was the epicenter of the earthquake last year um, and there's, a, there's an ambulance in Gorka, which basically they've got curtains in the back, but um, they're basically a stretcher with no cushion, and that's how they transport people through most of the country. Um, this is Ampipal Hospital. It's in Gorka region. So Gorka is a larger hospital. It has about four or five doctors and is like the referral center for some smaller hospitals, including Ampipal. And Ampipal is, a, is in a small village, and there's one doctor there, along with some staff. Um, and this is another view of Ampipal Hospital as you're driving up the road towards it. Um, so it's, uh, it's just above those terraced rice fields. Um, so we're in a, in, a, in a vehicle approaching on this road. This is the only road to the hospital. We actually ended up getting out and walking because it was faster than the vehicles could drive. Okay. Um, so transportation to care is a bit of an issue. Access to health care of any kind. You can imagine if you live on this side of this river and the hospital's on the other side 
and you've, uh, you're unable to walk, what a task it might be to get to health care. This is now a Parazi hospital. It's on the Terai. It's on the plain. I'll talk a little bit more about the geography a little bit later. Um, and you can see one of the uh, foreign faculty here. It's a public health expert. Um, so they have another group of students placed here. Typically, each hospital hosts between 8 and 15 students, depending on the class size and the cohort, uh, for six months at a time. And then they swap out, and then the other half of the class goes for the next six months. Um, so this is what it looks like inside Nawal Parazi Hospital, fairly basic. Um, and it's, uh, you know, they, they do lack some things, um, including a, a gloves. So these are latex gloves being dried after being washed for reuse. Um, the fairly standard practice in many developing countries. Um, uh, just to illustrate Stephen's points about, about the sort of types of countries where some of our interventions make the most difference. Um, the countries in blue are the poorest. Um, the, this was from 2011. Um, so average uh, sort of gross national income of less than $5,000 per year. Okay. You can see a sizable representation from Africa. There's Nepal. It's that little oblong hot dog looking country. Um, and you can see where the other uh, sort of lowest income countries are in red are the rich countries. Uh, no surprise as to where they are. So I'll share with you a little bit about Nepal and, uh, and what it's like. The, um, it's, uh, it's geography. The population is not too dissimilar from Canada, a little bit less. Um, the land area is approximately equal to the three, three of our maritime provinces pr uh, combined. Uh, but it's a wrinkly country, as you might imagine. So, um, it, so it's, it's a long oblong country and it's, in its longest dimension it could fit between Ottawa and Windsor. Okay, and its width varies between 150 and 250 kilometers. At one edge of that long, uh, long side of Nepal is a sea level plain elevation between 70 and 100 feet above sea level. At the other side are the Himalayas. The peaks of the Himalayas forms the border with China. Okay, so just imagine that for a minute. In a space of 150 to 200 kilometers, you're going from sea level to the tip of Everest. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of hills. Um, I'm not sure that the comparison with Canada is particularly helpful, but it might give you a little bit of context. Um, so the the, the, the percentage of the population that is urban and rural is almost entirely reversed between our countries. Um, the, uh, and you can see the, the huge income disparity between Canada and Nepal as a country. Um, health spending uh, as a percentage of income is about half of Canada's. And of course the, uh, the country income is low, so the health spending per person is about $40 US per year. Okay? So that, uh, that's what they can afford. This country has done everything they can to meet the UN development goals, Millennium Development Goals, short of providing more health care providers. So all the micronutrients, um, all the uh, vaccination, everything that can be provided by a poor country to a large number of people to improve health, they've actually done. They've been one of the most successful countries. Where they have un been unable to, unable to make significant headway is simply the lack of healthcare providers. That's the last kind of uh, piece of the puzzle for them. So uh, they have a high birth rate compared to Canada, about double an infant mortality rate that's about seven times ours, and the maternal, maternal mortality rate very similar to what Stephen explained about uh, uh, Ethiopia. Uh, many times what we have. And here's the physician supply. Again, this may not be the best indicator of health, but uh, it, it, there's a stark difference. 2.1 per thousand people in Canada and 0 0.1 per thousand people in Nepal. This is what childcare looks like if you're a preschooler in Nepal. This is a little shop that, uh, that this little girl's parents own. These are various forms of hard liquor that you can buy at that shop and they, they will also cook some food for you for lunch. It's sort of like a roadside highway, highway stop. And uh, um, these are school children. Uh, there are about 70 or more ethnic groups and linguistic groups in Nepal. The national language is similar to that in northern India. Um, but uh, the, there are many different cultures and communication is, uh, can be a challenge there. Um, and as I said, the majority of the people live rural um, and most typically live uh, something like this. This would be a, a large sort of well-to-do farm. 
Um, and here the animals and the humans actually have separate entrances to the dwelling. Um, I also visited some homes where the, the, they share an entrance, but uh, typically they cohabit um, more or less with their animals. And you can see some corn hanging to dry there. Um, the way the healthcare system is organized in Nepal, um, they have some, uh, the, smallest, the smallest sort of uh, unit is something called a health post. And that's usually staffed by some, some uh, workers that have two or three years of training. Okay, and there's a number of those spread through the country. And then uh, larger than that would be a village health clinic. Um, and they might have a nurse, they might have a midwife. Um, uh, very, very few have a doctor. And, uh, but you can see that about, and, but they support the, their, the, their health posts in their region. So there are about 10 health posts supported by a village health clinic. And then there are uh, rural hospitals that support um, about 10 or 15 rural health clinics, uh, village health clinics, zone hospitals, which are like a provincial, uh, provincial hospital, uh, the equivalent of that, and public health centers scattered throughout the country. So that's how the system works. These are the kinds, of, uh, the kinds of health workers that exist in Nepal and the amount of training they receive. So the, the lowest is the female community health volunteer. Some of you may have heard about barefoot doctors in China. This would be the equivalent. They get two or three weeks of training. These people are illiterate. They gather health statistics using pictograms and they're taught to treat uh, by rote three diseases and are given the tools to do that. They can recognize and treat pneumonia. They can recognize and treat diarrhea uh, in, in infants and they can recognize and treat malaria and they're given one treatment for each of those diseases. On a population level, this saves countless lives. And that's what's available to almost everyone in the country. Um, these people get no money, they get training, they receive some honor, and they get a pension when they retire, which is golden in Nepal. Very few people do. Um, so then you've got uh, different levels of workers with different amounts of training, staffing larger sort of elements of the system. Okay. There are some interesting developments in, uh, in, in within uh, Patton Academy of Health Sciences. They have a rural telemedicine program. It isn't like any kind of telemedicine program we have here where there's video conferencing between sites, but they have the ability for doctors in rural communities when the internet works to send cases to specialists in Kathmandu. And for the specialists, they're actually on call in the telemedicine room, and as soon as they receive a, a case report, a specialist in the appropriate specialty will respond with advice. A pretty remarkable for, a, for an impoverished country, and this was developed through funding from India. This is a different thing. This is, um, so they have these four hospitals with students, and they need to teach them stuff beyond just sort of looking after patients. So they have an academic half day. These, uh, they have a half a day where they, they, um, they provide case reports and commentary to each other. And they do this using a very uh, cost-effective video conferencing system. And this, this is the, the node in Kathmandu with two faculty running this and they're leading the conversation. They, they've got four sites up on their screen there. You can't see it here very well. This entire network was created for $30,000. Think about that for a minute. $30,000 contribution, um, created this five site virtual video conference network. They can see each other, it's jerky, but they can see each other, they can hear each other, they can transmit slides. We did this with three sites with our medical campuses in, uh, in Canada here at McMaster, and I can, I, uh, it's hard to get the actual cost, but I can tell you it's more than two or three million dollars, okay? And we get a lot of complaints about the quality of our video. They complain about the quality of theirs as well, but I don't think that at any higher frequency. Amazing. Um, student selection. Patent Academy of Health Sciences, uh, preferentially, their, their, their selection process uh, selects students that are rural, female, low caste, and if, and if they've had a previous career as a health worker in a rural region, one of these lower level health workers, they actually have evidence from in country that as doctors, those people have a higher likelihood of going back to their rural community to practice. So they also preferentially recruit them. So it's all about getting people into rural practice. They offer scholarships. Difficulty there is the school receives no government funding. 
they can't afford it. The, 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 the government can't afford to fund universities. So the medical school receives no government funding. The more scholarships they give out, of course, the less operating money they have, because that's their only source of income. So some foreign donors and philanthropists have created some scholarships. Um, but they've also created some very interesting partnerships with rural communities. They will go into a rural community that has not seen a doctor for years and meet with the leaders and say, how about if we go splits? We will offer a 50% scholarship, you pay half in exchange for, we will take one of, one of your brightest kids into medical school and let's hope they come back. There's a reasonable chance they do. There's some data from around the world that there's a better than even chance that'll happen. The curriculum is a standard medical curriculum. They've had coaching and assistance from academics from medical schools around the world. What they've added that we don't normally teach are these things, community health, population health, and they have actually built into the curriculum ways to get students to engage in a mandate for service and altruism. I think we can learn something from them. Uh, the locations of training, the students spend most of their time in this urban, urban hospital. However, in the first year, they spend two weeks in an, in an urban slum. And then as the years progress, they get into, into more rural placements and uh, from small to, more lar to larger placements until they end up in a hospital at the end. So their first rural hospital experience is at the very end. Every year they have a clinical experience in some aspect of the healthcare system. So they've actually seen it in operation by the time they graduate. And here are some of the, so they have an urban slum experience at the beginning, and then they've got these other sort of two, two to four week experiences through the, year, through the years, and then a, a six month uh, rural hospital experience uh, right at the end. This is the urban slum on the Basmati River. This is essentially a, a large river that mo when you drive by, you can, uh, you're kind of engaged with the idea that it's kind of an open sewer. These people uh, live here because nobody throws them out. Okay, the students were placed there for a week in first year. Um, the first two classes, they said that's not enough. So they actually live with the family in there uh, to understand what their lives are like until they get to know them. And they decided, to, the students gave the faculty feedback that a week was not enough to achieve that goal. So now they're there for two weeks um, in first year. Um, so uh, they had this earthquake. Many of you heard about that. Um, in 2015 and there's some scenes of, uh, of what happened at the time there was a lot of foreign aid that came in uh, well foreign aid workers that did some really good health care and disaster disaster care at the time um, there's Kathmandu there's the epicenter of the earthquake in the region of Gorkha was not the the epicenter was not where the most shaking happened the most shaking happened uh, in the red zone here you can see the country of Nepal it's sort of long and narrow this is, this is the, uh, the plain that's at sea level, and there's the border with China and the top of the Himalayas. This was a magnitude 7.8 earthquake, pretty strong shaking. It went on for some time. 24 hours later, there was an aftershock uh, with a Richter scale of 6.7, also a major earthquake. They were, and then frequent daily, multiple aftershocks, and three weeks later, another aftershock 6.8 magnitude. Now this really wrecked the country. You can see some scenes there. This is in Kathmandu, but it was spotty. This construction with cement pillars and bricks in between is built to withstand earthquakes. And you can see that much of the city's normal and some of it fell down. The rural areas, on the other hand, did not have that standard of uh, building code. So they were devastated. And there's some scenes of rural villages. So what happened at Patton Hospital during that time? The hospital didn't fall down. It was reasonably well built. But there was enough, there was enough trauma and damage uh, that they had to move everybody outside. So this is what it normally looks like. And uh, in this courtyard is where it all ended up. So there's the tent village that sprung up in the courtyard. The entire four stories of the hospital with 800 patients, 1,000 patients were looked after in tents. The concern was most of this is cosmetic damage, but they would not go back in there until they had an engineering assessment that it was safe. And with the frequent aftershocks, every time there was an aftershock, a major one, everybody would come outside again and patients would refuse to go back in, as would many of the workers. So here are some scenes, people being sort of uh, moved into the area. 
This is, a, this is a medical student pushing that patient. There are some more sort of helping out. Not really much panic. So the whole country's in a panic. Everybody's running around. And here it was sort of the orderly plan that Dr. Rajesh uh, created some years earlier. These are not uninjured people. They were pretty sick. And it basically it functioned out of tents as long as it needed to. And the performance of the students in the rural communities, as soon as the quake hit, we had students in, they had students in Gorka and Ampipal, right near the epicenter. Some of those communities were destroyed. They had a teaching center in a place called Nuwakot. The hospital was flattened. Thankfully, the students were not hurt. Um, they tried to recall the students, which is a bit of a challenge uh, logistically when, uh, when the country's in upheaval. The students refused to leave. They refused to leave their rural communities because they were needed there. So they provided what help they could. These were like final year medical students. Um, and without them, there would be one doctor and a few nurses in their community. They stayed because they were needed. And they didn't leave until they felt that uh, the place, place could manage without them. So this is issue of altruism and, uh, and all that, it, it seems to be working uh, in the curriculum. There's the orthopedic ward and a tent. And then uh, on the ground floor, they had some large foyer areas that they sometimes were able to move people back into until the next aftershock, and then everybody came out again. And these are some tent villages that sprung up in the vicinity where the families stayed, who had patients being looked after, and some of the staff actually lived there as well. You can see the domestic scene in the foreground here. This is in a nearby soccer field. And you can see the, there was concern about diarrheal and other disease outbreaks with these people all sort of conglomerated together. And uh, so you can see some of the, some of the students and faculty um, within the medical school, they actually made their rounds of these tent villages that sprung up around the hospital uh, to make sure that everybody was okay, that there was an, enough access to clean water. If anyone was ill, they invited them to get health care. So the project that I'm, uh, that I'm uh, leading uh, working together for rural medical education. Um, what, we've, uh, what we were asked to do by the medical school was to bring Canadian rural doctors to teach Nepali rural doctors in these four hospitals how to be good teachers. So the original plan was capacity building. The first group that went, they, <coughs> they found uh, the reports were that most of the rural doctors were either too busy or too uninterested to teach. And uh, they were also transients. The system of the government has of deploying doctors into rural communities is that no one stays more than two years and they're randomly redeployed without any kind of predictability and no coordination with the medical school. So there was actually no group to actually teach. And they asked us to reconsider the mandate, increase our presence, and do what, uh, what Stephen calls gap teaching. So the idea was that the students will get some education for at least part of their time there, as much as we can offer, so that when they graduate, they themselves can become better mentors and teachers. And so that's what we're just embarking on now, is ramping up the, the size of the team. What I've been able to do is get uh, 10 uh, rural doctors from Canada. Um, I'd be very happy to take rural doctors from other places, uh, but what, what's become evident is that they need to be rural doctors. The reason for that is no one in Nepal has ever heard of a rural doctor before. They can't conceive of that being a career for anyone. And what they need is some role models. And so the criteria for, for membership on this particular team is uh, a self-identity as a rural doctor. Uh, so I haven't practiced rural medicine for 12 or 15 years, but if you ask me what I am, I'm a rural doctor. I'm just masquerading um, or doing something else temporarily. And, and I think those are the kind of people that we're recruiting. And of course, they have to have some educational background and ability. Um, and they have to be willing and able to commit one month per year for five years unfunded. Okay, so they're giving up a month of income once a year for five years. So far, I've got 10 people doing that. As they come back and report on their experiences, it's very easy for them to recruit others. Most of them feel that it's they, they gain more, far more and learn far more than they, uh, than they leave there. And each volunteer goes back to the same hospital repeatedly. So each year they go, they meet a different cohort of students, but they spend time getting to know the hospital, the lay of the land, the allied health workers and the administration, the nurses, who are always there repeatedly. 
with the idea that the Canadian presence will become somebody that's welcomed back, um, that's been there before, that we all know. Uh, and then we can also talk about some educational development. So, uh, so that's, that's the project. Um, and these are the names of the four hospitals. It may not mean anything to you. This hospital was knocked flat, still hasn't been rebuilt. Um, so it's, it's working, it's operating out of tents, but they've been unable to get a doctor there. So without a doctor, they can't really have medical students there. So they've moved that uh, to a different site. So the original goal was to teach teachers. Now this is what, this is, this is what our volunteers do. Um, and we've been going now, we had, we had sort of one, one year of experience um, and uh, it was interrupted by the earthquake and then subsequently some uh, geopolitical strife with India sort of delayed us another year. So we were on hiatus for about a year and we're just resuming operations now. We have four people going um, in February, March, um, six for sure in the fall, possibly eight. And uh, I would like to increase that a little bit further. Um, we also have, uh, at their request, have uh, a faculty member from um, Memorial University is going to do um, a bit of a program evaluation for them, which is uh, something that they've asked for with the idea of instituting some continuous quality improvement into this rural program. And, uh, and if they, uh, and the, other, the other request that came that we have not yet sort of entirely figured out how to deal with, um, they've been in operation long enough that they've now graduated one class. And that class in the last month was deployed into a number of rural hospitals across the country. And the hospitals that, those, that these graduates went to, I was hoping they would go to these four rural hospitals and teach their younger cohort. That's not what happened. That's not, that's not, typically, it doesn't unfold that way. The Nepali government decided otherwise. It turns out the Nepali government is interested in instituting universal health care, but they don't know how to do it and they're not sure they can afford it, so they're running a pilot in a few communities. They wanted the people to have faith in the healthcare that they were getting for free, so they deployed PAWS graduates into those communities. And so PAWS is very proud of this, and uh, you know, that they've got the trust of the government, and I think that um, certainly the, um, the performance of the students during the crisis, the lack of drama, at pause during the crisis, which was in stark contrast to many other hospitals around the country, um, I think sort of, I think generated that. And I think it all starts from why are you here, right? So um, if this is your mission, I think the, the, the results, uh, you know, the extent to which uh, the, the development so far has reflected that, I think is a me some measure of success. Um, but there's still a long way to go. So we're about, a year, year and a half into this five-year project. What I expect, um, having, having had other, pro I've worked other projects with a similar plan, one month a year for five years. It's an amount that some of us can contribute. Typically what ends up happening, you never can predict exactly when it's gonna be over. Um, and so people at the end of it all, they decide when they themselves want to finish. <coughs> But by then, they've, been, they've got a connection with a rural Nepali community. Um, they've got an infrastructure. They know exactly how the lay of the land works. So as on their own, they can continue, and we can provide some coordination if necessary. Um, so we're not actually going to stop until it's over. But I needed some sort of a target so that this didn't become a forever thing. We didn't want to take over the teaching. So the, the plan is for this to be approximately five years. And in the meantime, we're assisting PAUSE with other things. So that's, that's the story of, uh, of the Nepal project. I'm very happy to answer questions or have discussion. I'm going to come up and... <clears throat>